Tonight's a bright spot after two and a half really, really dark years, an event that, like many other things, was postponed by COVID. On the other hand, it's made this moment a whole lot sweeter. Um, and I have to admit, and I know some of these folks on the stage, who should look familiar to you, um, I'm tired of hearing me say this, but I'm fangirling really hard to finally meet these amazing nurses. Um, oh, wait, I, for I forgot something. and not wearing the right footwear. There they are. I knew I was missing something. Now, I fit in. Most of them are really comfortable. You can mock Crocs all you want, but man, they are the right things for your feet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right, back to what I was doing. So rather than do that boring uh, moderator thing of reading people's biographies, I'm just going to introduce each of our panelists very briefly and allow them to tell you what they'd like you to know about them. We'll start with Whitney. Whitney Fear is a psychiatric nurse practitioner at the Family Health Care Center here in Fargo, North Dakota, which you all know because you just watched the film. Whitney, what do you want people to know about you? Um, I'm not really sure, so like I really thought about how to answer this, but like there was a whole thing. <laughs> Stacy is a clinical services manager at the Family Health Care Center here in Fargo, North Dakota, which you know because you watched the movie, but Stacy, what is something you want people to know about you? It can be anything. You know, um, I met my husband at the nursing home. Uh, he's not a nurse, but this year would mark 20, a year, 20 years of healthcare for me. I've been in healthcare since I was 16. I just turned 36. So. Woo! Yeah. I'm glad you stuck around. Dr. Misty Wilkie is not in the movie, but we are really glad she made the track here. She is a clinical associate professor at the University of Minnesota School of Nursing. Dr. Wilkie, what would you like us to know about you? Um, I am from the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa Indians in North Dakota. We're the only Ojibwe tribe in the state. Uh, I'm a wife, a mother. I've been in higher ed for 18 years and a registered nurse for 25 years. Awesome. Woo! Thank you. Woo! And Jillian. Jillian Gold is the Behavioral Health Coordinator for Family Health Care. Jillian, what do you want us to know about you? Besides the fact that you got really awesome shoes today. I almost borrowed Stacy's Crocs, seriously. <laughs> um, I think healthcare is a human right. Uh, I've had the privilege of working alongside both Stacy and Whitney and the other staff at Family Healthcare over the last seven years, and they do an amazing job of showing that and making sure their patients know that. And it's a beautiful thing. Thanks, Jillian. So, as we get started, I want to get panel's reactions. You know, I imagine all, have all four, I know you two have seen the movie before. Dr. Roki, have you seen the movie before? Absolutely. Okay. Julia, you two, I know. So what was it like seeing it on the big screen? Even better. <laughs> I agree, yeah. I, I, as soon as I watched it, I sent it to every one of my professional networks and fellow uh, nursing instructors and said, you need to be showing this in your classrooms. I watched it, I think, on my phone the first time and then one other time when we had the, the premiere. And I think there was a lot that I missed out on um, just from watching on the smaller screen. You get it on the bigger screen, you see the reactions of the people. I really appreciated that. Whitney, was it surreal? And for the introvert in you, you're gonna feel it. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. No, it was. It was. It was surreal. It's a, it's a different experience. That's for sure. Not one I ever thought that I would have. So it was definitely our post-COVID look, too. Yeah. Yeah. For I think sure. we've leveled up since then. <laughs> Also, we should note that Wendy, uh, Whitney's children, who made a guest appearance in the movie, are sitting here in the front row, so 
Bella, Remy, it's great to have you here. All right, so let's dig in a little bit. Let's talk about health equity, right? It's part of the subtitle of the movie. Whitney, you know that one of the, my favorite things that you say is asking people how they want their care and what they think is possible is communicative of respect rather than compliance. And I um, have said, how many nurses in this room have used the word non-compliance? Come on, if I confess up. Yeah, okay. If we could strike that word from our vocabulary, um, yeah, I think we'd all be better off. So talk a little bit about individualizing care to people's specific needs and the special role that nurses play in incorporating health justice into their practice. What are ways that healthcare systems and employers can support nurses in doing this work? I think just follow, follow the evidence, right? Because uh, patient-centered medical care is associated with much higher rates of better health outcomes, and there's really, you know, the data speaks for itself, I guess, you know. And it's also associated with a lot lower rates of burnout for the healthcare professionals taking care of those patients, too. It's taking the time to educate yourself um, and your and your staff. I, I work mostly in, in leadership, and I like to think of myself as a representation of a whole nursing team. But I think taking the time to educate your staff and yourself about the populations that you serve, and I think that takes a lot of self study and also finding people that you're safe with and have a good rapport with to ask questions. Um, like for example, I asked Whitney her opinion on, you know, things that are relevant to the Native American community, also knowing that, of course, you know, that's not all-encompassing of all Native American tribes, but, you know, making relationships, finding finding people that you trust, and having being able to have good conversations and ask good, respectful questions in a safe place. What can our systems do to better support that? I think remaining low barrier and person-centered is a really big part of that. Um, so, like homeless health clinic, for example, they meet their patients where they're at every single day. Um, no matter if they're having an outburst, no matter if they're screaming at the receptionist. I mean, yes, there's, there's reservations and there's things that we do to mitigate those things, but understanding why that person is behaving in that way, right? Like, you'd behave that way too if you'd have the day that they had. They slept outside, they are covered with mosquito bites. So having that lens is really critical, but also having the systems in place to support that lens. Yeah. What do you say to, you know, I tag on to that, Jillian, my sister's also a nurse, and she once said to me, I remember coming home from clinical, and I don't know what I said, and she said to me, you know what, no matter how bad a day you've had, chances are good every patient you've taken care of has had a worse day than you have. Um, and that was a, yeah, that was a, that was a smack of said that I needed that day. Um, but what do you say to nurses, or I mean any healthcare professions, right? Whether they're social workers, respiratory therapists, what do you say to, we're so busy? Knowing particularly post-COVID, the level of burnout, when you started to point to it, right? Follow the evidence, but how do we, how do we think about this in a way that it doesn't feel like one more thing? <laughs> you know, I think, um, you know, there's lots of different ways to, you know, incorporate that and what you're doing, and it's going to make your job ultimately easier anyway and save you time um, if you can really establish a good relationship with somebody right off the bat, you know, get their trust. Uh, they're going to be a lot more open. Um, you're not going to have to like pull the answers out of them. Right. Um, and you're going to be able to plan things better. So ultimately, it's going to save you time anyway um, and save you a lot of effort, too. Yeah. You listening, nursing students? Um, okay, so speaking of nursing students, let's talk about how we educate the next generation of nurses to advance health justice. And when you talk about it at the end of the film, that sense that this next generation is going to be the generation that starts moving in the right direction. I know better representation in the nursing profession is one way, and we've talked a little bit about that. Dr. Wilkie, I'd love to hear your take on this, but how do we, how do we, how do we instill this in the next generation of nurses? Um, 
So my passion for the past 18 years since I've been in higher ed has been to increase the number of underrepresented minorities in the nursing uh, workforce, recognizing that having increased numbers of underrepresented nurses will ultimately improve the health uh, outcomes for those populations. Um, so interestingly enough, this is one of the topics that I talked about with my DNP students uh, last week. They were assigned to read an article um, talking about racism in nursing. And as I was reading through the article, uh, saw that the goal by 2010 was to minimize racism in nursing by half. And like, when the heck was this article written? Well, it was written in 2000. That day, I had received an email from ANA uh, asking for public comment on eliminating racism in nursing. And so I told my students, here we are, 20 years later, dealing with the exact same issues with racism. And so part of my job as an educator is to bring up those cultural situations as often as I can. Talking about ACEs in, in people and just getting students to recognize that there are a lot of things going on in patients' lives. And never once have I ever met a single person who would purposely go against a doctor's orders, knowing that it's going to affect their health. So I agree. I absolutely hate the word non-compliant and don't think that any patient is ever purposely non-compliant. There is always a reason behind it. So before you chart that, find out the backstory. Find out the why. Mm -hmm. What do we need to be te teaching students that we're not? I know that my, I mean, I've, and I think Whitney and Stacy heard you say this, um, you know, I, when in nursing school, and I graduated just 12 years ago, um, there was a total, complete lack of any kind of cultural humility. You know, we, they used the word cultural competence, but it was a sidebar, right? Um, and I don't think you can be truly competent in somebody else's culture. I think you can have an attitude of learning. What, what should, how should we be thinking about nursing education? Any health profession education, Jillian? I think learning from your patient. Um, the people that I've served over the years in human services have been my best educators. I know Whitney and Stacy can probably say the same. Um, you know, taking the time to get to know their story and their whys and letting that shape your out out you and your look on things. Um, that's really critical. What do you think, Stacy? You know, when I met, so I graduated about 14 years ago and I would say that there wasn't a ton of cultural competence taught some. And I remember there was small things like this group may be more or less likely to talk about their pain and maybe more likely to say they don't have pain, things like that. But what wasn't necessarily covered is being respectful of what, how Whitney said, what the patient's goals are. I think it's real easy to go in there and say, oh, well, you're obese, you have this problem, you can have this problem, you have this problem. What is important to the patient? What is their end goal? Like, do they just want to feel well? I mean, maybe there's only one thing that's bothering them today, and then maybe, you know, next time you'll get to the blood pressure. Maybe next time you'll get to the flu shot. Maybe next time we can talk about the COVID shot. But what is today? What's going to make them happy and well today? And that culturally has a huge variance um, from, you know, where you came from, what your health care may have been like in another country. Um, all those factors come in. So I think just being respectful of meeting people where they're at, I think. You know, I once heard an, another nurse say that rather than saying, um, what brought you in here today? To which one patient said the, the bus. Um, but what if this visit is starting a visit with, if this visit is successful, what will have happened by the time it was over? Right, letting the patient define the terms of success. Um, in terms of nursing education, what are the things we can't teach in nursing school? What are the things that people need to bring to the table that makes them the kind of nurse that provides that patient-centered care that Dr. Wilkie, to your point, really 
moves us forward in addressing racism in the profession and in healthcare so that we aren't here another 20 years from now. I, I, have, I can't teach somebody how to care. Um, you, you have to bring that in. You have to know how to connect with people on an emotional level. Um, and yeah, the number one thing I cannot teach is how to care. Julie, how about you? I mean, you have different training from nurses, but what do you think people need to bring to the work that you I can't think, teach? I think willingness to learn from those around you is a really big one. Um, not you know thinking that you know it all from school, um, but realizing from your experience and, and the experience of those that you serve, um, that's a big part of who you are as a provider. Why is it so important to have such a diversity? And I feel like the answer to this should be obvious, but I'm gonna drag it out of each of you or some most of you. Why is it so important to have a diversity of lived experiences in the nursing profession, in any helping profession? So in my previous role, I worked as the homeless outreach coordinator for the city of Fargo and the Gladys Street Shelter. And um, the majority of the, or a large portion of the population that I serve is Native American. Uh, Whitney was a huge educator for me during that time. Um, at the end of the day, I'm still a white girl approaching a group of homies on the corner of 4th and Broadway. Um, and it went a lot differently when Whitney was the homeless health RN and came with me. Um, and they knew that she was indigenous and they were able to relate to her in a different way um, that was valuable to them. And I think that that's really important to just recognize that when they can go to an appointment with somebody that shares the same beliefs or values or um, systems, that's just, it helps them be more comfortable. Wendy? Yeah, I think, um, you know, what Julian said is, is really important to you know, it's not that um, you have to be the same ethnic background or cultural background as the person you're taking care of, However, if there is a person that's representative of a, like, you know, multiple representatives of all the different ethnic or cultural groups that are in your patient population, there's a better chance that um, you're going to have somebody to turn to and be like, oh, you know what, I have to have this, like, care conference with this family today, and I'm feeling a little nervous, like, do you, um, is there anything that I should make sure that I can ask or consider or contemplate, uh, things like that. Uh, you know, we can't know everything, you know, and that's something I, I think that is one thing with the state of nursing school is just like reinforcing you can't know everything, you're going to have to learn some of it as you go. Um, and don't be afraid of admitting that you don't know everything. Like it's, not a, it's not a fault, you know, you're not a robot. Um, and by the way, people don't want to get care from robots either. They don't. <laughs> like, they, like, literally and figuratively. <laughs> Like, um, they they want somebody who's who has like some emotion and, and has some um, they feel like you know is extending themselves a little bit to them in that moment because um, they're they're vulnerable you know and they're they're hoping that you will you know acknowledge that and care for them in that that time uh, but yeah, I think that you know having that that is such a big strength for the whole team and I guess. Whenever you were asking how can we how can we fit things in, I guess something came to my mind after them like, yeah, I have this saying it's not a saying I picked up, I heard it. I should maybe this to apply it said I made it. <laughs> Does it work smart or not harder? Right? And so if you work smart and diversify your team, um, follow the evidence, what says works the best. Things do it like I would say, you know, like family health care is crazy. Like it's crazy to work there sometimes, isn't it bananas? <laughs> But you know, we have such a great team <laughs> that like I've worked there for almost eight years. Like and I, I love my job. I love where I work. I I mean it might be like crazy sometimes, but like at the end of the day I have such a great team that I'm working with that it you know, it seems like it just things we work things out, we figure it out. I think for me too, there is joy in a diversity of lived experiences. It's that human connection. I think in many ways, it's why we chose helping professions, right? Because we like connecting with humans. Um, and that's what we are first and foremost as humans, so. 
So that's the end of my line of questioning, except for one question. Whitney and Stacy know how this works. We're going to do a rapid fire question. <laughs> um, okay. So, and Jillian, you can weigh in on this because I know in your training, you've also had moments like this. What was the skill, nursing students, you're listening because we were all terrified. What skill were you most terrified about learning, practicing in nursing school? And I'll fess up first since I was the one who came up with this question. So literally like probably three lab days into my community college education, they pulled out, I, I don't know how y'all are getting taught now because I feel like an old lady, but they got out the injection pillows. And I was like, I, I, I mean, I was an old lady y'all when I started nursing school. And I was like, oh my God, I can't stick a needle in a human being. That's horrifying. And I almost got up and walked out. I'm texting my sister or something. I'm like, I, I can't stick a needle in anybody. That's horrifying. I can't do that. She's like, just deep breath, just hang on. So there you go. I fessed up. Stacy, you're first. What were you most terrified? What, did you, what were you like, oh my God, I can't do the teach back on this? Well, I had an anxiety disorder, so everything. Um, so sorry for re traumatizing you. <laughs> Thanks for bringing up the injections, because that was the first thing that caused me to cry. But inserting a Foley on a female. Oh. But my mom was a nurse for 45 years, and she was like the Foley queen. So I knew I could, I could do it, but I still get anxious thinking about that. I lucked out. My first Foley was on an anesthetized patient, so that was that was awesome. Yeah, sorry. Sorry to re-traumatize you, Stacey. Julian, how about you? Like, what, what gave you the most anxiety as you were getting trained? You know, um, knowing that I could verbally de-escalate a man who is 300 pounds and 6'5", solely with my words, while law enforcement and EMTs watched, um, I didn't think that it was possible, but, um, possible, but um, I think we've all surprised ourselves in those situations <laughs> of verbal de-escalation. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a thing. Wendy? I was so stressed out to break an ampule, like the first time, because I'm so clumsy and awkward. I really am like this. Like whenever I was walking up those stairs, I almost tripped over my dress. I got my dress stuck in my shoes earlier, I almost fell on it. And I'm probably like, I'm gonna come down close to falling. Kim Steve knows I fell flat on my back one time, um, trying to imitate how my dog was running away from me. I fell flat on my back <laughs> in the hallway. Of the clinic right in front of my nursing student, like, hi, I'm the person who's going to teach you how to be a nurse today. Good fun, I love. <laughs> but um, no, it's a, you know, you feel it's like a glass thing you have to break, and I'm like, I'm gonna smash it. Like, I'm gonna smash it. My fingers are gonna bleed. I'm gonna bleed all over morphine, and then I'm gonna like, how, like, what do I do then? How do you document that lead in it, or like, what do you do? I was so stressed. I'm like, there's no way possible you can break glass like this, and it's just gonna work out. And like, I just thought it was unbelievable. I was working in the ICU at the time as a CNA, and they didn't have morphine ampules like up there. They, they it was then fix this thing in like a plastic vial. So the first time I did, I was like sweating profusely. I'm like, which makes it even worse. I didn't break it. <laughs> Dr. Murphy. Um, I am totally gonna age myself because when I went to nursing school, uh, they taught us all of the CNA skills um, in the associate degree nursing program. Now you have to come in with those skills. So the one that terrified me the most, people are gonna think I'm insane, was hand washing. Um, oh, no, 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 I had a lab instructor who, like, if you missed a step, it oh, was. Yeah. It was 100% or you're done. Yeah, that's right. And that, yeah, so my very first test out, knowing that I had to get 100%, oh, you best believe I washed my hands for like 45 seconds to make sure that I had everything covered, dry them for another, you know, minute, whatever. So, yep, that was that was my most terrifying. You had to buy a moisturizer on the way home because you did such a good job washing your hands. Why do we, we do that, though? Like, <laughs> if you can't tuck the corners of this bed, your nursing career is over before it even begins. Well, and I had a clinical instructor who was really good, and she said, you can't live, or you can't learn when you're frightened, right? But I think we have kind of created that culture at some point, you know, right? Which I think we're trying to unlearn, but it's hard to unlearn. I see Dr. Lee Shea here. 
but there's a lot of joy and there's a lot of pain and we can share that we don't need to be alone. Um, I think that's what will move our profession forward. So I'm gonna leave you with some final words tonight. This is from the book I mentioned. This is a different nurse, her name's Laura Devaney. She reflects on caring for a terminally ill patient in their 60s. Life is always a celebrated miracle on day one, she writes, and asks, is it any less a miracle after 63 years? Miracles aren't always awe-inspiring. They aren't always beautiful and obvious. Sometimes they're sticky and gross. Sometimes they're painful and full of loss. Sometimes you'll miss them if you blink. To our audience, to our panelists, and to nurses everywhere, thank you. Keep your eyes open. Don't miss the miracle. Thanks,